So let's talk really quickly about sole proprietors, single member LLCs, multi-member LLCs that are taxed as partnerships and S corporations. And let's talk about what owner, what owner's pay looks like for each one. This is another one of those things that might be super basic, but I know there are a lot of people who don't yet do the business return stuff or business accounting. So the terminology sometimes gets a little confusing. So when you're dealing with a sole proprietorship, the owner of the business cannot be on payroll. They do not take payroll. So when you're talking about owners paying a sole proprietorship, you're literally talking about draws. There are no loans to the company, loans from the company. It's just, they're putting in money, they're taking money out. It's an, it's an owner contribution, it's an owner draw. That one is pretty simple. Single member LLCs are the same way, right? Single member LLCs for tax purposes are the same as sole proprietorships. It's a disregarded entity. It's not separate from the owner. So for single member LLCs, just a little terminology tweak because LLCs have members, not owners. So it's a member distribution, member contribution. Again, single member LLC, 100% members cannot be on payroll. I have had people come to me where they're paying themselves on W-2. There's a lot of conversation in the accounting community about that's wrong, you need to stop right away. Frankly, if it makes them happy and they wanna pay for payroll, I'm probably not gonna make them stop because at least they're paying some payroll taxes throughout the year. That's a step up from a lot of single member LLCs that come to me who aren't making quarterly estimated tax payments. They're flipping out at tax time when they owe all this money. Honestly, I'd rather have them run it through payroll and be done with it. I'm not gonna argue with them about it. I will explain to them the correct way and then let them decide. But single member LLC, 100% members cannot, they're not employees, they're not on payroll. They don't get, they don't get payroll. They just take distributions. I think everyone's pretty clear on that, right? Because we, yeah, it's an illegal uh, so sean pointed out it's an illegal deduction for the 7.65 percent of the payroll tax yes and no because you're getting that an above the line deduction for that if you put it on a schedule c without payroll anyway so yeah it's technically not correct like i just said i know that's not the right thing to do but either way it's coming off the top sorry so uh, i would like i've to seen uh, single member and as a hundred person mm -hmm. owner cannot pay on payroll, right? Correct. They cannot be employees of their business. Oh. They just take distributions. Unlike S corporations, their, their distributions aren't limited to basis. They don't have those same concerns because you don't have to report a balance sheet or any of that for a single member LLC because that reports on the schedule C. But yeah, distributions, contributions, and they're done. No payroll. So then when we're talking multi-member LLCs, which are taxed as partnerships or just straight up partnerships that are taxed as partnerships, once again, partners cannot be employees of the partnership. They cannot be paid on a W-2. They can take guaranteed payments and they can take distributions, but they don't get paid as employees. And I've seen a couple of partnerships come to me that are paying their partners on payroll we have the conversation. I will generally make them stop doing it. Um, and and back to your point, Sean, when I have single member LLCs that come to me and insist on paying themselves via payroll, I document, document, document. I make the appropriate adjustments on the tax returns, but I can't, if I'm not doing their accounting, I can't force them to make changes. I could just report it correctly on the tax return. When I'm doing their accounting, they stop paying themselves on payroll because that's how it's supposed to be. Same thing for partnerships. When they come to me, if they're on payroll, we make them stop. If I'm not doing their accounting, I explain, I put everything in writing, and then as far as I'm concerned, I'm covered. So multi-member LLCs and partnerships, because you don't have to be an LLC to be a partnership, right? You can have a few people who just form a business and it's just a straight up partnership, but multi-member LLC with no additional designation, no payroll. How do you base guaranteed payments if there are no operating agreements in place? Roxana, that's a great question. And generally guaranteed payments should be laid out in the operating agreement. So if they don't have one, there shouldn't be any guaranteed payments. There can be. Um, in that scenario, I would usually require the partnership to put something in writing to me, an email where all the partners are copied so that everyone understands what, we're, what position we're gonna be taking on the tax return and in the books. But generally speaking, guaranteed payments should be specified in the operating agreement. 
If a partnership comes to me with no operating agreement, the first thing we're doing is consulting an attorney. I'm going to refer them to an attorney and I've got a few that I like to work with. I'll provide them with, you know, two or three names. And I generally will require that to work with me, they do it correctly and they deal with putting an operating agreement in place because there are so many things that are driven by the operating agreement and frankly, it just protects them. I mean, when I was a single member LLC, even before I made the S election, I had an operating agreement, even though I'm the 100% owner of my business, because it's just a good thing to do, right? I make sure that I operate in accordance with my operating agreement. It will protect me in the event of a lawsuit because I operate according to the written document. That's the, one of the foundations of my business. And so I will have partnerships that come to me, meet with an attorney and get an operating agreement in place. And generally speaking, if they don't already have one, sometimes that's almost better. Um, I've seen some partnerships come to me that got their operating agreements through LegalZoom. Y'all, I'm not even an, an attorney and I can pierce their corporate bill in like three or four different ways reading through those operating agreements. They don't even know they're not operating in accordance with their own agreement because they don't understand it and it's not, it's just not accurate. Um, so it should be specified in the operating agreement for there to be guaranteed payment. And I did have a direct message sent to me, not in the group, um 100 percent escort member can't pay wages by self what is the legal source for info that is incorrect s corporation 100 any any escort member that's greater than two percent and is active in the business is required to be on payroll so this is the one scenario that's different than the other three we talked about s corporations they must be w-2 employees if they're active in the business now if you have someone who's truly passive they're not part of the decision making like let's say they just put up money right they're a silent partner basically then they don't have to be on payroll but if they're active in the business own two percent or more they have to be on payroll at reasonable compensation which we've talked about before is kind of an arbitrary number because the irs doesn't define reasonable comp but then if you have a reasonable comp audit you'll be penalized if you don't hit this imaginary number so I'm here to tell you, I actually saw a post about this in one of the accounting groups that one, this one, the poster's client was actually going through a reasonable comp audit. It was a law firm. Each attorney was being paid $35,000 in salary and they were taking $30,000 a year in distributions. They're newer, so don't have a whole lot of money. Yeah, so they failed the reasonable comp audit. The auditor said that $35,000 is not a reasonable wage for an attorney. And so they got hit with a bunch of penalties and a bunch of distributions were converted to payroll, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and it's important, the S corporation thing can get a little complicated. There are certain things that are taxable to them that aren't to other employees, like health insurance paid for by the company. That's a taxable benefit to 2% shareholders. It's added to their W-2 in box one. Um, personal use miles, like the value of personal use miles on a company vehicle that's taxable. There are a bunch of other things that have to get added to the W-2, but the W-2 is important because for things like, let's say it's a 100% member of an S corporation, no other employees, and they have a SEP IRA. Their SEP contribution is limited to 25% of their W-2 wages. That's a big departure from a Schedule C where it's 25% of their net income. So for those S corps that love to do a $15,000 a year payroll and expect to make a $58,000 contribution to their SEP IRA, sorry, bruh, you're getting 25% of that $15,000. So this is a huge area of tax planning with your S corp clients. You really have to understand what are their motives. Um, yes, so Tosin makes a good point. The exception to the payroll requirement if they are not taking any money out of the company, meaning they took not even one penny in distributions, like let's say the company is getting started, they don't have enough money to pay themselves yet, including distributions, then they do not have to take payroll. If they're not taking any money out, they don't have to be on payroll, but if they take even $1, it has to be payroll. So that can be really important for your young S corporations. You know, those people who come to you and are like, I formed an LLC and the lawyer made made me an S corporation and you're like, why you've got $5,000 in sales. What was the purpose? Those people, if they're not pulling any money out, they don't have to be on payroll. So that's a good point. Um, Heather has a guy that will not go on payroll. He's the 100% owner. 
yeah so we see that happen too um i would this is another one of those areas where i i'm gonna talk the talk but i don't always walk the walk my advice is to disengage if they won't do it right right they're either going to do it right or they're going to do it with somebody else is it really practical that we disengage with every client who won't do exactly what we tell them to do probably not but you do have to remember that you have to adjust qbi right so one of the downsides to s corporation when you're doing your s corp versus schedule c analysis is that the members wages reduce the amount of net income that's available for qbi on an S corporation. So yeah, you're saving 15.3% in self-employment tax, but it's costing you 20% in QBI. So it's not all, it doesn't always make sense, but you do have to factor in phantom payroll. I'm going to call it phantom payroll for QBI purposes, because otherwise you're going to be giving them too much QBI. You're basically rewarding them for bad behavior and you don't want to do that. I have seen some people advise to issue a 1099, like reclassify distributions, and put it on a 1099 to the S Corp member and report it on Schedule C, that's not correct either. Now, not being on payroll is also not correct. So you do what you feel like you have to do. I don't do the 1099 thing because in my opinion, again, this is my opinion, the tax return reports what actually happened, right? They did not pay themselves as a 1099 contractor. So to report it as that is not accurate. They did not take payroll. And so reporting no payroll is accurate. Making an adjustment for in the QBI calculation for the payroll they should have taken is accurate. So you can take the approach that you want to take. I'm not saying don't do the 1099. I'm just saying I don't do it because that's not what actually happened. And this is, I've seen some people make the argument that as tax professionals, we do have a little bit of liability here in not reporting payroll. I tend to disagree because I'm not gonna report payroll that didn't happen. I'm not gonna advise the client to in March run a payroll that was due back in December and incur a bunch of penalties and interest, but I am gonna make the adjustment to the QBI calculation.